it pops the rest out for you um, because you, you're right. Like you don't want something to come in and take three hours to do. It's just not efficient. Like we spoke at the beginning of this, this is all about trying to find efficiency in how we coach, what we're coaching, why we're coaching it. And then the same for our players. Why do they do what they do? And it's the most important uh, thing is them understanding that. Um, so yeah, for sure. If anyone wants to have a play at this, uh, I know it looks intimidating with the colors but essentially all you do is type a couple numbers in the white box mm. <laughs> so i'll definitely show you if, if anyone's interested for, for sure reach out I, I think for for somebody like myself it is it is a little in, intimidating in regards to the fact that like i'm not a numbers person i'm not a math person i'm not I'm, so you don't have metrics, like, like you don't all have that to do anything <laughs> it gives it for you it says you're you're at this level uh you're at this oh. level or you need to improve this or you need to improve this um, so it does all that for you once you, once you put all the information in, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, it took a long time to build. I won't, uh, I won't lie. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sure. You I know, can imagine. I, I, yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about this, you know, cause obviously we were talking about data and now we're kind of seeing how all of this is kind of being put together, uh, in the session, because ultimately you can collect all the data, Susk, but like, if you can't actually, properly find a way to incorporate that data into your session design to help these goalkeepers and there's no point no absolutely but isn't that's the goal <laughs> you know the goal of the data is it's, it's not to have a pretty spreadsheet it's it's to see where the deficiencies are where the strengths are mm -hmm. and and implement them and so now and and you've asked me this before like what you know what are your sessions going into like season well it, it's dictated on, on a lot of this data and what, what the strengths that are showing themselves, you know, for Abby Smith right now, what's going on? Like, you know, like, like, you know, is she too far off her line and getting, you know, or this, and, and how do I now take this information from the past game or the past three games and really start incorporating that when we have our one-on-one -on -one time or when I can set up drills with um, the team to, to work on this, because at this level, you know, you're not, you're tweaking things, <laughs> you yeah. know, you're tweaking, you're tweaking inconsistencies. And so, so that's what this is used for. Yeah. You know, Brody, I, I, a question for you. So we're looking at this session right here. What data yeah. was collected to put this session together specifically that we're watching right now? So, yeah, this, I mean, this would have been a session, um, you know, I, I would have, if you go back up to the, or you don't have to go to it, but the, the crosses and, and key passes mm -hmm. uh, slide is what I would have used um, and video from opponents is what I would have used to, to sort of plan the, the design for this, having a look at the different areas that they, you know, take crosses from, where are they trying to right. hit their crosses and where are their second phase um, shots going to come from. Nice. Um, and this is just a, just a variation or a fairly simple I think uh, exercise on that. And I think what's important about this is you get a lot of like goalkeeper coaches out there and stuff for your young, your keeper makes, let's say gets beat in a game. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean the next week you have to design all your sessions around the way they got beat in that game. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Like, are, do you think that a, they're going to train that AD doesn't get hit off the post in her back and the ball go in the goal? <laughs> like it was a fluke goal, you know? It, you want to look at, like I said, inconsistency, something that's, that's repetitive, you know, did, I'm just using this, did AD get beat and hit off the post because she isn't covering her near post properly. So go back to your data and see, well, how many goals have she's given up near post or how many like rebounds or is she out of position in that? Is that why that happened? That's one way, but just saying, I'm good. We're going to practice this just because you gave up a goal from it. That, that's, it's not, you know, productive. Yeah, Suski, you brought up such a great point right there because I'm just thinking about just like from the recruiting process, right? The college recruiting process and how many coaches, assistant coaches, especially who are not goalkeeper people will walk by a field, see one action right in their notebook. And that's the scouting report on that goalkeeper. Oh, and forget like, it. I used to say it on the sideline at UCLA, <laughs> like Amanda and Amanda then would look at me and go, what? I go, like we train that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, sorry, that wasn't in like our training scenario, a near ball that hits off the back of your head and goes in the goal. <laughs> I can try, but like, you know, like, like, sorry, but crap happens, you know? 
So. But 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 I, th- I think the thing is, Brody, is like if, if you're like, let's looking, you know, again, you looking, let's say college recruiting type or, or youth club stuff right there. You know, I can't tell you how many times it's the the scouting reports are wrong because of they've only seen the goalkeepers in three showcases, you know. In, in mm-hmm. one in a desert environment, another one in a winter environment, and another they're maybe one. playing yeah. with like the best ECNL scene and a team, and you're not seeing much. At yeah, all. yeah, yeah. Or, or they're like guesting for another club. They don't even know these players or whatever, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, we saw so and so, and like it seems like this is what they seem to always get caught in this situation or whatever." And it's like, <laughs> are, "Are you sure about that?" Or do you see them week in and week out with their club? And that's why it's so important, I think, for especially young players nowadays, Brody, with to, to have the huddle you know, where they can really show their footage consistently, you know, week in and week out to send to college coaches. You know, I'm just using it as an example for somebody who's, who's watching this, who's in that situation. Yeah. Video, video is massively important um, as we said. And then like you said, Sask, being able to record those trends, like a one-off, sometimes a one-off goal doesn't matter, but if it's happening, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, but again, someone's got to record that, write it down, make sure that that's what's happening. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we just have to take that responsibility maybe as the coaches or someone's got to build a tool to help us record this easy. Like it's just, there's gotta be something there for us to, to help this, I think, um, in college. So that it's not so reliant on, like you say, someone walking past a one game and saying, Oh, that's what I think of that goalkeeper a hundred percent of the time. And exactly. you've got no idea on what the context is. It's so important to understand context. Um, and then and then and then go from there. Yeah. Even 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 on the positive. Even on the positive. I can't tell you how many times a goalkeeper has been brought into a camp and they weren't necessarily right for that camp because well, I saw them at Disney and they made this amazing top hand save <laughs> and you know and so I, we figured, y'all, we need to kill, bring this goalkeeper in. And then they come in. It's like, I don't understand. It's like terrible in possession, can't handle crosses. Sure, go, or, like- but that's a good point. <laughs> or you see somebody that's you think is great under, in possession. But what's the context? Is it every team that they've, you've seen them play against or a couple times there's like low pressure, low block, mm. no pressure whatsoever. So they have like, you know, 20 yards to make a nice crisp pass. And then the minute <laughs> you get them under pressure, they were like hitting, kicking into attacker shins. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so question for you, Brody. So let, let's say like when you're acquiring data and a player isn't with you, because obviously you brought in Abby this, this season, you know, as an, mm-hmm. as a new goalkeeper at, at the club. And let's just say she had not been getting a lot of minutes, uh, you know, in, in the role that she was in, you know, obviously, you know, behind, behind Bella. Um, so how do you how do you acquire data on a player that's not playing? That's a really good yeah, question. I'm, sorry, hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, what I had to do, I, I was we were using Instat at the time, um, and, and to be fair, I I had to go over a lot of Abby's older clips to get a sense for for who she is, mm-hmm. and then I, you know I'm lucky enough to understand Nadine quite well over in Portland, and so I, like I understand how she works, so I would have I, I know what. Abby would have been exposed to over there. Um, um, and so, yeah, basically I had to try and tie up my imagination with that side of things. And then, and then what the stats were show. What's up, dude. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Can you hear me? Okay. Absolutely. Dude. You sound fantastic. You sound okay, fantastic. We're trying. All right. We're trying. I'll, uh, I'll throw Brody off the screen right over here. And, uh, and then we got ourselves right there. Beautiful. I love it, man. Thanks for, thanks for sending all that stuff. And uh, sorry about the compression situation. Uh, the stream can only handle so much bandwidth apparently. So. Okay. Okay. That's a, yeah, that's the worst. Everything, everything came, uh, came through though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got everything. I got everything and, and, and figured, figured everything out. I also connected with Y scout. So hopefully moving forward, everything will be all right with that. I don't know if you ever have, uh, you know, uh, glitches with Y Scout, but uh, I yeah. I have a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, they they seem to happen more like more regularly than you would assume a platform like that would have, considering that's like the go to for teams to like get it exactly. Exactly. Um, all right, let's uh, let's get this uh, going here. Uh, here we go. Welcome 
Welcome to Inside the 18. I'm Michael Majid, live from West Hollywood, California. With me, no 99 World Cup winner, Suskia Weber, because she's too big time over at CBS Paramount Plus, getting ready for those games this weekend. But filling in uh, the, the, the illustrious uh, massive shoes of the one and only Suskia Weber, we've got someone pretty darn good. We've got FC Cincinnati to goalkeeper coach Ryan Coulter. Ryan, what is your exact title at FC Cincinnati? Because I know it's a lot more than just the second team goalkeeper coach. Yeah, so second team goalkeeper coach would be the primary role, but kind of uh, jack of all trades, really. Um, I go in, I help out the academy. I help out with uh, Paul Rogers with the first team as well. So it's uh, it's sort of across the across the full spectrum of of the goalkeeping department, really first team all the way through. So it keeps me uh, keeps me busy. I mean that that is for sure. I mean, you know, one of the things is is that obviously the last time that you were on this show, you were over at the Houston Dynamo Academy. And uh, Paul Rogers uh, left Houston Dynamo where he was the first team goalkeeper coach to become the goalkeeping director over at FC Cincinnati. So why don't you kind of catch up some people on, on how that that journey happened for you and, and how you made that decision to, to head over there? Yeah. So, I mean, when I first uh, when I first got in contact with Paul, it was in 2018. I actually went in on on the pro camp that he was running down in Houston, um, which they continue to do now and, and which we've even done one ourselves this year at Cincinnati. So. Um, kept in touch with Paul over the course of the year while I was with Forward Madison. And at um, the end of the season, I went into RGV Toros in a player coaching role. Um, and at the end of the season, the Toros kind of went to, went their separate way from, from Houston. So I saw it as a great opportunity to, to just kind of never really focus on the coaching side of things. So I moved up to Houston, um, took a job in the academy working alongside uh, Paul Rogers and Jason Grubb. And, I think for anyone obviously involved in, in goalkeeping to have the opportunity to work alongside two coaches of, of, of their stature was a bit of a no-brainer for me. Um, so I was there for a year. Um, the year flew by, to be honest. Absolutely flew by. Um, lots of laughs over the course of the year, for sure, and, and lots of growth as well. So um, Paul got the opportunity to, to move to Cincinnati at the end of the year. It was a new opportunity for him. And um, kind of one thing really led to another um, a lot of a lot of different bits and pieces happening towards towards the end of that season, and um, yeah, I mean the opportunity arose at, at, at Cincinnati for me to for me to go and join Paul, and they decided to have a second team very late in, in very late in proceedings. Um, so I mean, I had I had a phone call from Paul like a couple of weeks before preseason started, and I pretty much had to uh, pack my life into the U-Haul and get myself on my on my merry way up to up to Cincinnati. So it's been a it's been a journey and a half really over the last year and what four months. Um, you know, a really, really enjoyable, you know, and, and speaking of that, you know, one of the really cool things that I've noticed in regards to that whole, whole department that you've built over at FC Cincinnati, and I don't want to say, you know, that you, st you all started the goalkeeping department over there, but there's been some tremendous growth in the past year since you guys, uh, uh took over that, 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 um, that department over there. But, uh, you know, is obviously there's been a lot of movement between the first team, the second team and the academy. I've, I've noticed a lot of players being signed to homegrown deals. Obviously, everybody knows about Roman's success, you know, moving up to the first team and and really, um, you know, uh, establishing himself as a number one there and even getting into the national team pool. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's Paul's a perfectionist, really. And, and when he took the at Cincinnati, um, like he did when he went into Houston, it wasn't a case of, I just want to look after the first team. Uh, Paul wants to have a, have a footprint and, and make, make his mark from, from really the, the, the goalkeeping department in its, in its entirety. So even like you alluded to, coming in as head of goalkeeping means that he is gonna, he's going to basically oversee everything from top to bottom. So um, again, the primary role was to, to ensure that the first team would, would get off to a good start. And begin to climb their way up the table after having kind of a, a, a series of, of, of bad years. I think the first three years weren't great. So um, primarily, obviously, take care of the first team. But from that point forward, then once that was once that was in place and, and starting to make prog uh, progress, it was now a case of what could we do with the second team and, and into the academy. So uh, one thing like we had established in Houston that, that Paul did a, a really great job of was making sure that he had good information of, of every single goalkeeper at the club. And that meant putting a lot of care and, and putting a lot of um, time into really understanding all the goalkeepers that were there and understanding where they were and what their projections were. So, again, coming into Cincinnati, it was a case of, right, we've got to get to know all these kids and figure out who can go where and, and, and what our projections for them might be. And um, Like I said, it's been, it's been a ton of work 
Um, but we're just trying to make trying to make incremental changes, and even if they're small steps, we're just still trying to move in the right direction because there's plenty of growth we can do, um, and there's plenty of success that we believe we can achieve here in a club as as well resourced as this. Yeah, you know, you know. Speaking of that, and um, by the way, I want to give a sh- big shout out to everybody. I've got it over on the left hand side over there for all of you who are not watching Man U versus Chelsea, and instead of you're watching Ryan and me, I honestly want to say a massive, massive thank you. Uh, you all, uh, I don't know if you guys have made the best decision in your life, uh, but we definitely appreciate it. And for those of you guys who are watching Man U Chelsea right now, um, well, actually, you probably wouldn't be listening to this right now because you'd be probably seeing the replay. But if you're watching this right now and your friends are watching Man U Chelsea, tell them at halftime to come over here because Ryan's got some incredible information and uh, or to watch the replay later on. Um, Ryan, in, in all seriousness, no, uh, speaking of, um, you know, the big time and everything like that, you know, just the, the growth of people like Roman and even, even people, you know, um, like, you know, the, the, you know, the young boy that you've got coming out, uh, I apologize. It's Walters, right? Walters. Yeah. Paul Walters. Yeah. Paul Walters. Uh, who's, who just came in into the, into the environment at, at 18. I think that is a testament that why. Imp- so it's so important to make sure that your entire, for lack of a better term, foundation is solid because then that makes the progression for these players into the first team so much easier. Yeah, I, I think I don't think there's ever a right and wrong when it comes to coaching. Because I think if there was a right and there was a specific formula that worked, I think then we would all be doing the exact same thing. Uh, I think we'd be producing the same players, the same type of players, be it outfield players or goalkeepers. So I think it comes down to the the type of players you have, the type of coach you are. And, and like I said, it's going to be each to their own. But if you have rhyme and reason to, to what you do and you have some sort of success with what you do, then I think even more reason to to kind of double down on what you're doing. You can still show an interest in, in other methods and other ideas for sure and, and continue to grow with the game. But I think to, to show any sort of development um, and progress with what you have, I think you have to be consistent in your approach. So... Again, going back to going back to me following Paul here for the for the job. Paul's very open to obviously me going into into the first team environment, and again, me learning from Paul over the last few years has meant that we see the game in a very similar way. But make no mistake, we're two, we're two different people um, with two with two big two, or sorry two two hugely different personalities. Um, Paul is extremely intimidating. I wouldn't consider myself a very intimidating person. So again, we, we, we'll coach in different ways, but fundamentally the information that we'll give will be, will be very similar because we see the game in, in, in a similar way. So when we talk about looking at, at an entire goalkeeping department, if we can ensure that the information from top to bottom is consistent, that might be delivered in different ways through different coaches. But if the messages can be consistent in terms of what the, what the overall approach is to what we want from an FCC goalkeeper, then it gives us that more chance to be able to produce ideally on the top end what we're looking for. So like you said about Roman and like you said about, about Paul Walters. Paul Walters was an academy kid that no one really saw, no one really saw him making that transition moving forward. Um, by the time I came in and took the job when, when Paul brought me along, um, Paul Walters was a U19, so he came in with us for the guts of a year, uh, did one semester off at college, but even in the course of the, the seven or eight months he was in with the second team, his steady growth was, uh, was incredible, really. Um, we saw him again at the pro camp, he came back in to train and we started to talk to each other and just said, if he's two years younger than the next crop of, of the best college goalkeepers that we see, why would we not try and pull the trigger on, on getting him in, in our full control where we can, we can get hands on him every single day. So um, it's been, uh, it's been interesting. Paul, Paul's a bright, Paul's got a bright future ahead of him. And again, we've got another young goalkeeper in Roman at the club as well. And some experience in, in, in Evan and Alec um, we're, we're in a pretty good place. Yeah, you know, I mean, by the way, you know, speaking of Paul's, maybe you just, if you shaved your head, maybe you'd be more intimidating. Maybe if you just shaved your head, uh, people would be, uh, you would be uh, less, less approachable. Uh, no, in, in all, in all honesty, I think, you know, one of the things about Paul is I think, and, and this has happened with myself too, is that he comes across as, uh, he can come across as intimidating, but then when you get to know him, you realize how much he's willing to give and invest into people that are serious about the position and serious about learning the position. For sure, he's he's a perfectionist and he wants things done the right way. Um, and again, even even taking the job here, the work that he had put in over the six and seven years with with Jason down and down in Houston to build up a pretty good department. And even through the academy, goalkeepers in national pools, um, homegrowns coming through, 
Paul's been here a year now and he wants he wants that same level of, of success yesterday. So again, there's, 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 there's a ton of work to, to be done. But yeah, like you said, he's, he's passionate about the game, passionate about the position. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a 35-year-old goalkeeper or a 10-year-old goalkeeper, he still wants to coach and, and still uh, still put his print on things. So, so speaking of consistency, you were bringing up consistency and obviously about the consistency in the department. That is today's topic, guys, is, is consistency. I think this is a fantastic topic, Ryan, that you brought up in regards to uh, in regards to developing the right habits and also recognizing consistency and maybe some, some improper habits going on, too. Uh, in your words, what, what do you think of when you hear think consistency? So when I think of consistency, I think that there are habits that we can create in our environment there's obviously not 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 all things are are fully in our control in terms of the external factors players be it academy kids obviously they've got schoolwork going on they've got family life whether it's a pro again they've got family life they might have a wife they might have kids there's different things that we can't control but i think when it comes into once they set foot in the in the building can we have a consistent approach in terms of what we're trying to do otherwise it can become a bit of a case of throwing throwing stuff against the wall and just hoping something sticks. Um, and it, when it becomes down to, sorry, when we talk about development, I don't think we talk about development over the course of one training session or even a week. You talk about development over a sustained period of time. So if we're looking for incremental change in, in goalkeepers, that needs to be done consistently and over a pretty uh, over a pretty long period of time. So we've got to have, obviously, our structure set out to be able to see what we're, what we're trying to get at the end of it now whether that's setting up tra training sessions a certain way, whether it's doing video to be able to reflect on sessions gone by. There's a variety of different things that we have to, uh, that we have to take care of. And again, it, it means being structured, planning, and just being consistent in our approach as a coach, but also as, a, as, as someone that's not just a coach. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to say a friend because we can't necessarily be friends with everyone because I don't want to necessarily drop my best friend. So when it comes down to having that approach, it's being honest, um, setting certain standards, creating an environment in which they know what the situation is, whether it's a Monday morning or whether it's a Saturday night in front of 25,000 people, there's a consistent approach to what we want. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I want to talk about that, Ryan, really quickly in regards to, you know, the consistency of, and I love that you've got off-field responsibility and on-field responsibility because I wasn't even thinking about this, but I've been in so many environments and I'm not going to name names where, it hasn't been consistent in regards to the off-field responsibilities as well, too. And that can cause for a lot of chaos in the department, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see the stuff when the, when the guys come to the training facility. Um, as I said, I'll talk about first-team goalkeepers, second-team goalkeepers, um, and academy goalkeepers. We will see what happens when they come into the building. But if you've got a 35-year-old pro with a wife and a newborn child, and he comes in and he has a bad training session, if you're not aware of what's going on in his personal life or you don't show an interest in, listen, how's your morning going? There's going to be a certain type of training session that happens and you can be sitting there at the end of the day going, I wonder why they had a bad session. The same thing with a 17-year-old kid um, playing in the academy. They're going through a bad run of games. The easy thing to say is, oh, they're, they're, they're in bad form. They're whatever else. They're not performing well. Well, that kid, that kid could be in the middle of finals. He could be in the middle of a heap load of assignments that have built up because he's doing online school. He doesn't know how to deal with it. He's away from home. He's away from the comfort of his friends and family. And yet we're going to just try and treat them as a robot that you've got to perform today. You've got to perform. I mean, I think at the end of the day, no kid or no kid or goalkeeper is going to show up to training saying, you know what, I'll have a bad day today, but they're going to happen. But if we can have a better understanding of why, there can be a bit more of an understanding of, okay, well, maybe we've got to, you know, we've got to maybe give him a little time or, or have a little chat with him just to let him hit a hard reset. And then we go again for the session. You can waste reps, but you don't want to waste sessions. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's a great point right there. I mean, I'm even just thinking about the fact that, like, you know, everyone's got inner life going on in regards to, like, their prior circumstances before they walk in. For instance, I had four business meetings for the union before we started this podcast, so I'm all over the place. Uh, you wouldn't know that unless you talked to me and and had that uh, uh, that conversation, you know, prior. So maybe we should have done that. Maybe, Ryan, you should have approached me earlier and been like, hey, Michael, are you good to do this podcast right now? Do you need to reschedule? Uh, was that meeting a little bit too much? Uh, do you need a 10 minutes to uh, grab some food? Because I haven't had lunch yet because I'm a little bit, uh, what would what, what you say, lightheaded right now. And Manchester United and Chelsea are playing on, to the left of me right now. So I need to turn that TV off. Anyway, uh, moving on. 
Uh, guys, you can check me out, michaelmagidcomedy.com. This is a disaster. Anyway, let's move on here. Let's talk about this consistency right here um, in the coaching because I think this is massively, massively important. Ryan, I personally have made the mistake of not being consistent in my coaching. And the reason is, is because of prior life going on. And I think a lot of us as coaches, I don't know how you feel, we need to compartmentalize what we have going on in our lives once we get to the field. Because if we bring that to the field, it's going to affect our young goalkeepers. Yeah, look, rightly or wrongly, I think as a, as a coach, you're not really in a position where you can't show up at, at, at any given point. And whether that's show up on the, on the end of the phone, show up in a training session, or show up at halftime giving information to the goalkeeper, or showing up at the end of the game to talk to the goalkeeper if, if, if they are the type of goalkeeper that needs that needs a conversation again it's knowing the individual i don't know if the goalkeeper needs needs some words after having a bad performance if i don't know the goalkeeper so that's that's the thing some goalkeepers might have a bad game and say i don't want to see anyone i want to go home i want to shout at the dog shout at my missus and come training uh, on tuesday and, and and just get after it that's some people some people might have might finish the game and go I, I really just need some words just just so i can be able to close the chapter here and move on and, and, and have a fresh week. So again, the consistency is massive and, and it, it's, it's knowing your goalkeepers and knowing what they're like. Um, but again, as a coach, while we're just talking about players there that again, have external factors. Yeah, we do as well, right? I might get back. I might have a bad night's sleep. I might be sick. I might be whatever else. But if I come in all doom and gloom into the training environment and I'm trying to create something upbeat to produce good actions on, on a day and, and produce an environment conducive to learning and growth, if I come back in and I'm not 100%, there's no way in hell I can expect the goalkeepers to come in at 100%. So you've got to set the you've got to set the tone, you've got to set the environment, you've got to set the set the standard from from the moment you walk in. Whether that's having the session preset, so the goalkeepers are walking out going, okay, this means business. I'm not walking out and seeing someone throw a few cones down here and there because that just looks a bit unprepared. I'm not saying you can't have a good session that way at all. It's different coaches do things different ways, but. I'd like to feel that the more prepared I am, the more structured the environment is, the goalkeepers know, okay, it's business. We're coming out to train. Everything's set up. He's kept up his end of the bargain by having things organized and structured. We now are stepping into an environment that I need to do the same thing. So Ryan, I, I think uh, it's just important. I, I want to step in really quickly right here because you just brought up a massive point. I want any young coaches out there who are dealing in, 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 and a lot of you deal at youth clubs, independent clubs, you know, you don't have the major league soccer MLS next type situation where the an environment is, is set up for you. Um, what advice do you give to like young coaches out there? Because I think one of the problems we have at, at the, at the youth club level and in the independent clubs is a lack of consistency in the environment. You know, today they're on field three tomorrow. You have six yards over there. Uh, the next day uh, you're going to have to go to this other park because we've got this scrimmage going on right there. So how can they deal with that and still keep it consistent? I think it comes down to, again, it's easy for me to say, Oh, you need to do this, 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 or this, because I'm in an environment where you've got kit men, running all over the place, getting you equipment, you've got whatever equipment you need. But I also look back to the fact that it was only a couple of years ago when I was a goalkeeper coach at, you know, UCF, and I was coaching at a, at a local club as well with a similar kind of setup. So I look and you don't know what the number of goalkeepers you're getting, you don't know what pitch you're going to be on, you don't know how much time you have. So I just think about session design. And I'm like, if I can ensure that I have a simple training session, which allows me to produce certain coaching points and hit certain topics and certain areas that are going to be beneficial to the goalkeepers that's going to be more important than me planning on setting this intricate training session with balls moving all over the place and different equipment everywhere because it's far easier for something complex to go wrong than it is for something simple to go wrong less is more less is more now there might be days where you can set up something more complex when you know specifically what you have your time frame and everything else but i think when there's variables up in the air when it comes to coaching, I think we've got to strip back and say, okay, less is more. If I just need a couple of discs and, and I'm good to go, maybe that's the session I stick with if I don't know what the session looks like. Um, here's something that, and I love what you just said right there because that I think that'll ease a lot of young coaches out there because I think they get that deer in the headlights type of situation because they go, oh, I prepared for this and now I'm, I'm dealing with this type of a thing. And I've seen so many young coaches think that they have to overcomplicate things in order to look good, quote unquote, to the to the to the directors of the club to make them think that they know what they're doing. 
uh, when in reality, the game is simple. And and speaking of that, the pathway is also simple if you've set up a solid foundation, right? Yeah, for sure. So again, when we look at it, we look at the FCC philosophy and the game model. So I think when you when you take a job, be it in a, in a youth club, um, an ECNL team, whatever it might be, an MLS Academy, an MLS Next team, whatever it might be, I think the first thing is to try and understand well, what the club is about. What way do the club see the game? Because my opinion is only my opinion. At the end of the day, I'm part of a far bigger, far bigger picture. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lower in the pecking order. So I need to have a better understanding of what's above me and what I'm trying to produce higher up that ladder. So having a good understanding of, again, this, this, this would involve having numerous conversations with Paul about, okay, well, what are we looking for in, in an FCC goalkeeper? Because yes, I can go into the academy. I can work with a 17 year old. I can work with a 16 year old, but what do we want out of the 13 year old? So how can we set the 13-year-old up for success? What 13-year-old are we looking to bring into the club? Because a 13-year-old at our club might be something totally different at a different club. But that can be the case if we know what we're looking for. Um, again, the positional references, that's going to be stuff that we talk about uh, club-wide in terms of taking up penetrative positions. Um, obviously, the middle grid there, when you look at that recycle-type position, is generally it's going to be harder to play more penetrative, um, higher-value passes from that area because you're still somewhat deeper in the box. When you think about younger goalkeepers as well, um, at the age of, say, 15 or below, they're not physically capable enough to hit those longer passes. So the higher that they can stay uh, involved in the in, in the game, now if they're playing a pass from the 18 or higher, now that little flicked ball all of a sudden is over the halfway line and it's in beyond the back four, as opposed to if they sit in the reset area, it's going to be very difficult to play penetrating passes and it's also going to be uh, extremely difficult to look beyond. Um, again, it, it changes at the higher level, the more physically... Um, physically developed that you are but again as much as possible staying involved in the build is going to be important you know it's, it's, it's I love what you just said right there Ryan because it was just making me think of something that, that Matt Turner who obviously is at Arsenal right now said on, on the show a while back and he said the fact is that is that regardless of the level that you're playing at if you keep those skill sets consistent as you advance as you mature physically as well too you're going to eventually be successful. So don't be concerned about the fact that you're failing at the foundational level with these spurt and skill sets because at some point it's going to click and it's going to happen. And if you get frustrated and stop doing it because it's not successful just so that you try to win games 9, 10, 11, in the long run, it's going to be detrimental to your development. I couldn't agree anymore. We, we have this conversation all the time. I just spoke to some of the academy coaches last week. Uh, we were talking about goalkeepers and, and recruiting and what we're looking for. And again, my point was, if we have a goalkeeper making mistakes at 13, 14, 15, in the grand scheme of things, I don't, I, I'm not really that concerned over it as long as we are consistent with what we're looking for. So again, like you've just alluded to, Michael, if we're telling a goalkeeper that we want you to play in a penetrative position, we want you to stay more connected to the back three because you're going to be able to find more interior passes and, um, and eliminate lines. Well, now, as soon as the keeper gives one ball away, which they're going to do, as soon as they give one ball away, and now all of a sudden, if we start hammering the goalkeeper because he's, he's misplayed a pass, well, you can be sure the next action he gets, he's going to be sitting in, in, in row four. He's going to be way off the pitch. He's not going to want anything to do with build-up. And now we've basically undone all of the work we've done in training. We've undone all the positives because of one action and because of our response to that action. So be careful. We've got to manage our emotions. One wants to lose games. Completely understand that. But... We've got to think of the long term versus the short term gains, especially when it comes to the development of younger goalkeepers. Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the worst trends that I see, you know, Ryan, at, at, at the youth levels, and obviously it's a little bit different at, at the independent clubs than it is at the academies. Uh, but especially at the independent clubs is so and so is having difficulty with the goal kicks. So center back so and so is now coming in, stepping in to take those uh, because they, they can't handle the deep balls. First off, Anybody who's just launching balls at the foundational ages, uh, you're defeating the whole purpose of, 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 of possession with purpose uh, and the initial restarts. So that that's a whole other conversation. But I've seen so many kids. And now I get a kid at 13, 14 years old, ECNL, or just stepping into a, a first-time MLS Next environment, uh, DA back then, and and they can't strike a ball. And they can't strike a ball for distance with purpose because no one's ever no one's ever asked them to do it, um, and that's a real problem. 
because now you're starting to get into the college recruiting ages and there are certain skill sets. And you know this when you were coaching at the collegiate level that you're looking for and you don't have the time to bring in somebody at 18 and teach them how to do that. You're just going to find another player. 100%. It's funny because this is this this was only a conversation we were having recently as well. I think the idea of building out of the back is is wonderful and possession football, absolutely fantastic. But not every team in the world and not every player in the world is capable of playing beautiful build-out football like Brighton are doing. Brighton can do it because they've got certain personnel. When you look at other teams that don't necessarily have that, that personnel, they're not going to be trying to play out. We could even be funny with it and say everyone talks about Stoke City on a Tuesday night. Are Stoke City going to be trying to get the ball down and, and, and tiki-taka their way out of the back? I don't necessarily think so. Um, we were talking about these goalkeepers in, in the Premier League and Championship that go out on loan to lower league teams. So when you think about playing conference football, again, by and large, it's going to be quite a physical direct league. But when you get these uh, Premier League goalkeepers that have come through academies and, and playing in Premier League settings where they are trying to build out, the issue is they go out on play, playing loan, playing six, seven, eight, nine, ten games. They come home early because they've got quad strains and hip flexor issues because they've never been used to so many balls over distance. So it's a lost art. We we all admire Ederson because of his ability to play beyond and to be able to play real high value penetrative passes, even even over lines. So if we admire that, we're hypocritical in one way. Be, um, we're hypocritical in one way because we we admire how beautiful that is. And yet we go back into our environments and we're saying, no, you've got to get it down. You've got to get it down. You've got to get down and play. So how is that 13 year old kid that's in the environment where he's told to play short every day? How is he ever going to have the ability or even the wherewithal or tactical understanding to notice where and when I can play those longer passes? Again, it's, 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 you're just hoping at some point that it's going to be able to happen, but it's, it's, it's a trainable skill set, and it's a trainable skill set that we have to look at much the same as taking crosses. If we don't work on goalkeepers taking crosses, then the chances of them being successful at taking crosses when they turn 18, turn 19, turn 20 is going to be extremely small. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you, you even right now, Ryan, is, is that one of, my, one of the deficiencies in my own personal game is my long play. And the reason is, is because I, I never got enough consistent reps and saw the pictures properly. What I mean by that is just I was just hitting if if everything, if it wasn't close short, if there was not something available short, I would just hit it long but there was no actual tactical you know, conversation on where to hit this. What are the scouting reports? Why am I hitting it here? How to drive that ball? Why should I float this ball? Why should I, you know, all those sorts, bend this ball, all those sorts of things. It was more just kind of left to my own devices. And I think it's just important that we give young players the skill sets and the tools so that they can be consistent in every scenario, every scenario. Um, with, 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 with you know, um, I want to talk a little bit about out of possession right here because, you know, obviously we talked a lot in possession right there. Consistency out of possession is massively important, in, in my opinion, when I'm scouting uh, at the collegiate level or, you know, at the young professional level or whatever. If I see inconsistencies from a possessional standpoint, um, you know, I say, OK, well, you know, how are they out of possession? And if I see the inconsistencies out of possession, I say, well, we've got a real problem here because that's the number one job of the goalkeeper is to keep the ball out of the net. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about positional awareness and and, and, and creating some consistent habits in that? Yeah, I, I think like when we, when we talk about the out, out of possession stuff, I think if we... The easiest way to do it is we say, right, we're all off scouting and we're looking at goalkeepers is probably is probably the easiest way to break it down. So I think probably the first thing you look at is body language, how someone looks when the other team is in possession, because that it's a huge thing. Are they engaged in the game? Do they look sprightly moving around the goal? Do they look, do they look like they're on the front foot? Do they look like they're able to deal with various scenarios that might come? Do they look like they're scanning across the back line? Problem solving versus just being reactive to, to, to when the problem comes. Finding solutions rather than just finding, um, finding things that happen just nice and short and sharp because the game moves terribly quick. And if we wait to just see the game based on exactly what happens right in that moment, it moves too fast. And that's when you see these 50-50 decisions that we make the wrong decision or the decision to just stay at home. So when we talk about out of possession, again, it's, it's, it's having a good understanding of A, where the ball is, B, what the pressure is on the ball. So we can get caught up in looking at where the goalkeeper is and where the back line is and just say, okay, he looks like he's connected to the back line. But again, the game is all centered around the ball. So where is the ball at any given moment? Where is the back line? And now where's the goalkeeper? So it's like it's like a three-prong effect because they're all gonna they're all gonna relate to each other. So 
as the ball moves, is the goalkeeper moving? What options is he taking up if the ball moves from, from one half to the other half? Are they, are they following across down the line of the ball as against just vertically high? Are they moving horizontally across their line to be able to protect wide channels? We see it all the time. Big balls played into, into, into corner spaces and goalkeepers having to run from the penalty spot, run laterally out to deal with it as opposed to seeing that a right back's under pressure and almost moving ourselves into the line of where the ball might go to to make it easier now to come onto the ball as opposed to chasing it. Um, so again, it's, it's really important. Micro adjustments down the line of the ball when you think about shot stopping. Um, and then recognising moments where we've now got to go and protect the area or protect the space in behind. It's bravery. It's being comfort, uh, confident in, 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 your, in your positioning. And it's difficult when you talk about telling goalkeepers to play higher. And probably the one thing that I talk about is when you say for someone to play higher, the reaction is they'll go three, four yards higher. But now as soon as the player's on the ball, they start dropping back. So I always say, right, if we're going to work on it, play two yards higher than you want to play, but now drop off a yard and play on your front foot. So you're still playing a little bit higher but you're still remaining on your front foot as against just telling them to play high and then they go defensive. So get a little bit uncomfortable, then drop off a yard and then play on your front foot and just stay there a little bit longer. And you can make incremental change that way because it's a psychological thing more than anything. You're always worried about being all behind you. You know, it, 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 it's, it's so funny that you said that, Ryan, because I'm, I'm just thinking about just in, in regards to myself personally, and I'm use, just using myself as an example because I'm here right now. But... Um, even 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 as a more mature goalkeeper, let's say, you know, um, as as you got older and I started playing at a higher level, experienced goalkeeper, veteran goalkeeper, let's just say um, a lot of it was a, a switch in mindset of if I'm comfortable staying high up here, I'm actually from a from a from a, 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 a subconscious standpoint, I'm, I'm already making myself more of a preventative goalkeeper than I was before where before I was more of a reactionary goalkeeper. Um, and, and obviously, you know, one of the things about that too, is that a lot of teams, the plays happen so quickly. So if a ball's played over the top, goalkeeper's already playing high, you're already at an advantage as opposed to a goalkeeper who's playing a little bit deeper because they're not comfortable playing so high because they're so worried about that, you know, and again, I, I, you bring up, you bring up Ederson, you know, I, I, I spoke to somebody, you know, who was uh, over at Man City and they said, you know, one of the things that, we we always pride ourselves in is that if this is how we want our goalkeepers to play, then we are willing to accept the risks of playing like this, and we will accept that for the benefits that come for it. So, like maybe maybe we drop a few points here and there in the season, but we'll end up winning twelve to fifteen points more just by playing this way. It's learning, isn't it? I mean, it's 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 like it's like anything. If 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 you say, okay, you're going to learn to play the guitar, and you hit one bum note, and someone says, no, that's it, you're done. Well, then you're never going to improve. So, if you talk about having a having a clear structure in terms of what you want from the goalkeeper, now it's going to come. I mean, there's going to be consequences with anything, right? Positive or negative. There's going to be consequences. So, once everyone's on board with the consequence, that listen, he might play high, for instance, and it might present it might prevent seven 1v1s over the course of three games, fantastic. But now in your fourth game, they make a slightly wrong decision and they get rounded and they score. If you're okay with that, because understanding that over the course of the long run, what you're going to prevent versus what you concede is going to tip the scale in, in, in favour of, of it being a beneficial thing to do. It also comes down to the profile of the goalkeeper, right? You might have a goalkeeper that isn't necessarily best suited to playing higher. And again, that comes down to understanding the environment that you're in, Again, it's difficult probably in, 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 in youth clubs to say this is the specific goalkeeper that we want. But when you start going higher up the levels, you're now recruiting goalkeepers based on the way the team play. So someone that can defend the space isn't necessarily going to be needed in a team that play a low, a low block 4-4-2. You're going to need someone that's going to, going to be comfortable coming protecting crosses, coming and protecting shots from distance. Whereas if you've got a high-pressing team, a New York Red Bull that just press, 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 press for 90 minutes, now it's it's a pretty good idea to make sure you've got a goalkeeper in behind that's going to be comfortable to go and mop up what happens when the team look to relieve pressure that when they're getting pressed. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a bigger picture thing, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, and you, you know, talking about this developmental pathway right here, I'm just thinking about this is that those consistencies are massively important in regards to the progression to get to that first team. One of the problems we have in this country, and for those of you guys who are watching the show around the world or listening to the show around the world, I know it's a little bit different in, in, in other countries, but here in the United States, we do have a lot of independent grassroots clubs that you go from, and even at the same age group, you could go from a, a U11 team A to U11 team B in the exact same club, 
and and the demands are completely different based on the way they play. What advice do you give to coaches that that deal with that to keep the development consistent for all these goalkeepers as they come through their program? Yeah, again, it's tough, right? It's and and it's a good question because it's something that is is posed to coaches all over the country and and all over the world, in fact, where there are inconsistencies in terms of the age groups, the levels, at the teams, even even within those age groups. Again, I think when you talk about younger goalkeepers, um, I think that's generally that is generally the time that you can you can give them a bit more freedom to try and understand the game. Um, but I think when you look at younger goalkeepers and the types of goals that they concede, more often than not, they're not technical issues. Most of the time, it comes down to tactical issues, like we've just alluded to, positioning, decision making, and everything else. Oh, keeper was beaten at the near post again. You're also going to be dealing with ignorance of 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 head coaches and coaches that aren't necessarily tuned in to actually having a better understanding of what goalkeeping's about. That's a battle that we're going to face all the time, but that's for another day. But again, it's 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 having an understanding that we've got a duty to the goalkeepers to make sure that they're in a good headspace to understand what we're asking of them. So whether that's doing video work with them, uh, little Johnny plays for the under 12s for his club team and concedes two goals, comes into training on Tuesday and says, my coach said I was awful. I conceded two goals on the near post and I should have come for the 1v1. It's very free, easy for us to go, oh, well, you know, better luck. Oh, come on, we'll go again this week. But if we can, I know it might be an additional bit of work. If we can have some opportunity to reflect on those goals with that goalkeeper, maybe we turn around and go, I'm sorry, but your head coach is completely wrong. Your position in that moment was fantastic. There's no way you can come and deal with that ball or talk about a positional adjustment where now kids can learn. Everyone is attached to these now. Every single person is attached to these. So it's so simple to do video review. Video review doesn't have to be fancy in a cinema. It can be done off a phone, off WhatsApp. We even do it with the academy goalkeepers. Tactical understanding is essential. And even our, even academy goalkeepers at our club that are 17, 16, 15 still have a ton of growth to do in tactical understanding. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, sp- and speaking of that, like, I think that it goes into the session design right there, because I think the video needs to go into that session design when we're talking about, you know, simple to complex to live, all those sorts of things and the team integration. I think one of the things that I've seen in a pattern consistently at the youth level that I've seen is that it's consistent at activation, warm up into the technical work, and then it's not consistent from the complex to the live. Yeah, for sure. And, and again, like when we talk about this would be typically how I would look at designing a session. So the activation stuff, we're fortunate. We've got, um, we've got the athletic trainers inside. So the goalkeepers are pretty tuned in in terms of what they have to do on any given day. So they'll do their activation and they'll start to get the blood flowing inside. So when the goalkeepers come out, now we're looking at the specific activation of what we want to do. So whether it's high ball activation, whether it's getting getting our hips open because we're getting into one v one topic, whatever it might be on the day, whatever the doctor's ordered. But then when we look at the passing ball work, there's always going to be some sort of passing um, in the training session because when we look at the actions at, at our level, you're talking about seven or eight to one with your feet. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's big passes or small passes. But over the course of the week, we need to see a pretty good variety of stuff with our feet because not that not that we're saying that we're a build-out team, but we're a team that the goalkeeper ends up with the ball seven to eight times for one with his hands. So it is essential that we make sure that they're going to be somewhat comfortable on the ball. Again, not looking for the next Ederson. We'd love it, but it's making sure that they're going to be comfortable and confident when they are in possession. Um, again, then when we look at the technical side of things as well, technical movements and actions broken down in isolation so we can nail down techniques before we start seeing it in a more complex scenario where they've now got decisions, they've got moving pieces, they've got traffic in their eye line as well. So that would kind of be how we do it before before pushing them on into the team. See, you see, you know, you, you, just, you just brought up such a great point in regards to you, wanting to make sure that all of that is taken care of before you throw them into the team. Because I've seen so many young coaches and they go, well, we've done some activation. We've done some technical, just go them to the team and just have at it. And there's no instruction whatsoever once that they're at the team. And a lot of it, Ryan, and again, you know, I understand that these environments are challenging when you're at these independent clubs because you got the 18s are over there and the six, sevens are over there and the 14s are over there. And it's difficult for you to walk around to all these different fields, but you got to have some sort of a game plan. You have to have the conversation with these coaches and say, this is the demands of this goalkeeper right now. I want to work with them on this. Let's come up a game plan so that on X day, I'm there working with them on that. Otherwise you're just throwing a goalkeeper to scrimmage with no instruction whatsoever. For sure. And and a big piece of it, Michael, is 
we we talk about ourselves being goalkeeper coaches absolutely for me when i look at it as a goalkeeper coach our job isn't done as soon as that last save is made and they walk off into the team because like we've just been speaking about so much of it comes down to decision making positioning feedback so if we're if we're not in a luxurious position where we can do video feedback with these goalkeepers all the more reason to right mike we've done our goalkeeper session off you go in with the 16s that i'm now standing in behind the goal so now when you can see that goal i'm saying listen this is what we're talking about about keeping your right foot in the floor to make sure you can get that little push in whatever it might be talking about your positioning or listen maybe you play a yard higher a yard deeper whatever it might be so now we start to get a bit of active feedback and some actual learning and coaching in that moment because when they're in the goal is the most important time the stuff that we do is to prep them for the game it's to prep them for getting in with the team. So when they when they get in with the team, there's no point in us. Our job's half done at that point. We've got to finish it off by getting in, standing in behind the goal and talking the goalkeepers through through the actions that they're seeing. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, one of the things that's that's brought up right there too, Ryan, is that even when we're doing our active sessions, it's still very it's still conceptual because it's not the it's we we don't have the actual players that they work with day in and day out in their team environment. You know, we're either working with other goalkeepers or maybe if we're lucky, some other outfield players come, but it's still not the game. It's as realistic as we can make the session. Um, and it's so I, it's just so important to do that. I, I don't know how you feel about this because again, the challenge is at the independent club level. And, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because so many people watch the show who are not in an MLS Academy. And is that why, if you've got, 14s, 15s of, of comparable level, let's say 14s, 15s, 16s of comparable level, you know, talk to one of the team coaches and say, hey, I'm going to bring these goalkeepers over into this environment today. and We're going to work here. I know this is not specifically their team, but at least I, I have a better idea of, of what's going on. If it's not possible to see them in their actual team every time. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like the game, the game is the game is unscripted, right? So again, it's 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 an opportunity, like you've said, even if it's not my team, but I'm getting in with players, well, it's still an opportunity for us to go and coach because we get into the game and the players we're playing against are different every week. So even if it means getting in and I'm not training with my team, well, even more reason, if anything, that looks more like the game. Because now I'm now I'm dealing with scenarios and and shots or crosses or deliveries or runs or different profiles than then I'm going to see in my own training environment. So if anything, Michael, I'd say that would be even more realistic to the game is going in with, again, if, if, if it's the only opportunity that arises that you're going to go in and train with a different team. Okay, so be it. The in-possession stuff, for sure. There's going to be breakdowns because it's not what you're used to. But still, just because it's not what you're used to doesn't mean you can't do things with quality. Doesn't mean you can't do things with intensity. Doesn't, think you ca doesn't mean you can't do things with professionalism. Carry yourself in the right way. Breakdowns will happen. But as long as they don't happen because of complacency or laziness or composure on our end, well, then that's fine. That's going to be learning. That's going to be growth. Yeah, and I think I think that's really important is is to put that in regards to from the consistent learning process, and that we can put that within our own behaviors as coaches. Is that mistakes are going to happen and goals will be scored. I think it's actually something that Paul uh, Rogers, you know, said to me. He says he says goals will be scored. So you you can't you you can't try to make sure that goals will never be scored because that's not realistic. You need to understand how to do the best that you can do to prevent goals and to be the best supporter that you can for your team. And if, if we provide an environment like that, I think it's going to, we're, we're going to be better off. I mean, I, I, Ryan, I don't, I don't know how you feel. I'm, I'm hope I'm not mincing Paul's words type of here, but, but it seems to be uh, kind of, kind of part of his philosophy. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's it's making the saves that we should save and giving ourselves an opportunity to make the bigger saves that no one expects us to make. But I think when we start, I talk about this with academy goalkeepers, I talk with the second team goalkeepers, spoke about it with the guys that came in on the pro camp as well. If we worry about the whole goal all of the time, it doesn't necessarily give us the best chance to be successful in that moment. We've got to think about our positioning being right to cut off sections of the goal when you start to talk about angles, different heights, different deliveries. If we can be successful in the third that we're in and ensure that we've got good shape, that we've got good balance and give ourselves the best chance to be successful with whatever action we decide to produce, then we're going to be more successful in the wrong one. But if we go into the goal and think, okay, bang, this is off the angle. I've got to protect the whole goal. Now you start with left, right, and all over the place, trying to do everything all at one time. The same as a cutback. You're trying to protect 
the near post you're trying to protect the near post runner you're trying to protect the one that's been hung up to the back post if we do that we're ending up doing half of one thing half of another and you end up not being successful with any it now leads I, I, to I, I, I just love what you just said right there because i think that is the mindset especially of a lot of young goalkeepers as they feel that they have to they have to be able to cover everything every scenario everything that happens it's it's on them to make sure that that action is successful as opposed to recognizing that you have to deal with the immediate danger first and then and then you can adjust after that. So speaking of that, let's look at this right here. So what is what is this that you have in front of us for, for everybody listening in audio? So for me, it's, it's how I map things out. And again, a lot of people talk about the resources that, 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 you know, that we have and we're fortunate to have at a higher level. For sure, we have. I can print things off, off Scout. I've, I've got ability to go onto Stats Bomb and get whatever I want. But for me, I like spending time putting this together on Keynote. So this is all done by I. What it allows me to do is take time to be able to really look at each action and where things are coming from as against just clicking print on a computer and not really maybe digesting things properly. I can now have a, a finer look at trends that we start to see. I mean, I think for everyone, we'll, we'll, we'll pretty much agree that the majority of chances in this game were in a pretty central area, right? They're in either the first six, the second six, or in and around the penalty spot. So straight away, we're looking at actions that are going to be central and pretty tight to the goal. Then when we actually look at where they're going in the goal, now you start to think, okay, a lot of them central, a lot of them just off center, not really a great deal in top corners or big flying saves. So that's not to say, again, this is where this is where analysis becomes really important because some people can go either way with it. This is what that specific game looked like. So I can say, okay, that's what that game looked like. The next game might look totally different. But if I pull up a stretch of six, seven, eight games, and now you start to see a bigger, a bigger portion of data showing that we're dealing with things in central pockets. Now I can say, okay, that's an area that we've got to focus on. That's not to say, oh, Paul, this weekend, by the way, you're not going to see any shots from a wide area because of course it can happen. It's the same with session design. If it's a 1v1 topic, that's not to say that you're not going to see a strike from range that day. If it's a crossing session, that's not to say that you're not going to see a second, a second phase ball coming at you from six yards away. So again, when we look at, Again, this breaking down now into the area defending. So just to give me an idea of where the crosses are coming from, and I like to map them out in terms of where opposition contact is coming from, where the team defending is coming from, where crosses are getting just eluded, that they're just going out of play, or where the goalkeeper's taking up range. Again, we can look at this and just go, look, it's from A to B. Why is the goalkeeper not coming there? Of course, there's going to be context. This might be where our whole back line defensively from from, from the delivery have come right in on top of the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper may not have the opportunity to come and deal with the cross. So again, it's having a better understanding of what this map looks like in context. Context is key when it comes to session design, when it comes to analysis, when it comes to reviewing, because anyone can look at a page and go, why is the goalkeeper not taking those two in the six-yard box? They might be balls that were zipped on the ground. They're not necessarily hanging into the six-yard box. So they might be early crosses that have got shaped into that area. So these are all the things that we only know with our bigger portion of information. See, I love how you brought that up, Ryan, because, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had, you know, directors, you know, show heat maps, you know, or team coaches, you know, for uh, from a club team and go, here's the heat map from uh, from from Man City Showcase. And uh, let's 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 take a look at his. So obviously he's getting scored on a lot here and here and he's making saves over here, here, here. So you need to work on making sure that he doesn't get scored on from here. I'm like, OK, well, what happened? He's like. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I know that he kept getting scored on over there. I'm like, well, that doesn't help me in regards to building a session to to deal with this. And, and I think it's so important that all of these pieces are put together in order to find that consistent, getting back to that topic right there, consistent picture of the trends that we're seeing over and over again. I see too many times, Ryan, especially at the younger ages, coaches being forced to work on something that was an outlier because that's what the coach brought up to them and said, hey, so-and-so Scott scored on on the near post and blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, how often does that happen? Well, well, you know, it happened this weekend at surf. Okay, cool. How did it happen before? He's like, I don't know, maybe. Okay, well, that then, then again, that's not helpful to me. You know, so how can these team coaches give productive information to these coaches? Yeah, again, like this is, this is something that I've done by eye. So, whether it's printing out even even the likes of a template like this and while you're on the sideline kind of marking where shots are coming from i think that gives you that gives you enough of a reason to go to go and talk to a coach i've done it before i've done it over the last couple of years where i go into a head coach i say listen like 
these are the these are the mapped out goals that we're conceding and this is where we're conceding a lot of cutback crosses coming from maybe we can have a look at this in training because we're getting a lot of balls that are coming in over our left side and we're now conceding a lot of opportunities one touch finishes two touch finishes from cutbacks from this pocket maybe that's something we can address with the team and look over in video and they're like okay brilliant coaches have so much to deal with that if we come in and we're wishy-washy in terms of what we want or what we think we want sometimes we can get pushed away it's understanding where we're at what our voice is and when our voice should be heard but now recognizing the moment that okay i have a window to say something i need to come in with something pretty concrete as opposed to going um yeah michael this weekend you know just if you have a minute i thought that you know maybe this happened or we could have done this that's just a nonsensical answer as opposed to saying listen michael i've watched the game back the goals that we conceded they're coming in from that wide pocket. Defensively, we need to get someone coming in on that near post pocket because it's not a ball that the goalkeeper can deal with. Have a look at the clip. There's no way he can come and deal with it. Maybe we can take a different approach to dealing with this certain type of ball. Bang, done. At least in that way, you've provided something. You've got it off your chest and you've taken care of what you can take care of. You can't then make a coach do anything else beyond that. All you can do is take care of what you can take care of. And and that comes back to you being consistent in regards to watching the film as a goalkeeper coach of watching the film of these teams. And again, I know if you're at a youth club, there's 90,000 teams. We get it. But they all film on huddle. So if you're seeing if there's a if there's a specific player that you want to find some information on, you just can contact. And if the coach can't get back to you, talk to the team manager. Chances are they have the footage and then you can go go to the coach. But I love, Ryan, what you said about you have to take the responsibility yourself. It's the same thing as like the reason that I've been training in the same spot with that what's muddy, you know, because the sprinklers are on every Tuesday at four o'clock is because I never said anything all season. And so it's, they're not, it's not even coming into the director's mind that this, this is not working out for you. So you need to, you need to be specific and you need to be able to speak out about it. Um, uh, any, anything else in regards to these slides here? So this is, this looks like obviously, um, a, a little bit of a pie chart from the game actions against a uh, Philly union. Yeah. So again, going back into the session design, when we spoke about always ensuring that there's some sort of passing action going on there again, like we said, look, it's, it's, it's just information. I just like having information. It doesn't mean now that my next session is, oh, this is what it said. There were 11 shots against and they came from these specific areas. Okay, Tuesday's training session is going to have exactly that. Oh, it's just giving me an idea of what it looks like. Because also now next time we play against Philly, I know this was the type of game that we can come up against. I'm preparing goalkeepers for SEC 2 the way we play, the way we defend with our personnel. We are going to give up different chances than Philly are going to give up. We're going to give up different chances than Toronto are going to give up. So if I can create a pattern and have a look that these, are, this is our tendency to give up opportunities from here, whether it's oh you, do, you, you, you give up opportunities from pullbacks into the second six or you don't get pressure on the ball to someone at the top of the box or you give up a lot of crosses, whatever it might be, each team to their own. If I have a better understanding of this with our team in terms of how we're set up, these are the opportunities we give away. Now I know, okay, fellas, Let's make sure that we know how to deal with these actions that we give up a lot of. Yeah. And, you know, and I think, you know, one of the things in, in regards to that is that if you if you have that understanding of of all of that is that you're going to be able to make the adjustments based on the teams that you're playing to. Um, so that it's not a cookie cutter like, oh, this is the template of what we use. And then all of a sudden it's not successful against TFC two because they're a very different team than union two. So you have to, you have to recognize that. And then, and then once you have all these different charts, you know, so-and-so just to make it simple, you know, for everybody who's listening right here, you know, you can go and say, okay, this is consistent regardless of who we play. This is inconsistent because it's de determined on the teams. Um, it's not going to, but it's never going to be perfect. And I, I think I, I want young coaches to hear that out there because they might see somebody like yourself doing this and they go like, oh, well, if I do it like Ryan, it's going to be perfect every single time. It's not right. Yeah. I, th I think the fact that we conceded five goals against new England and four goals against Toronto in the last month, I think it's fair to say that it's not always going to be right. Right. So you yeah. look, prep preparation is preparation. And again, you can prepare as much as you want for games, but ultimately as soon as that whistle goes, the game is going to produce what the game is going to produce. Players pl players just want to go into a game feeling prepared. Now, if we can prepare them in the best way that we can by, like you said, Mike, if we can take a hybrid of 
these are the type of actions that we give away. These are the type of actions that we've been seeing over the last number of weeks and marry that together with, listen, New England Revolution, this is how they attack. These are the types of goals that they've scored. These are the type of attacking actions that they have. If we can find some kind of marriage between those two, now I can design my session for the week and say, do you know what? They deal with a lot of flank balls. We've not dealt with a lot of balls from, 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 from wide areas, but because, of, but because that is a key component of their game, now it makes sense to do that. If they're a team that go direct, I'm not going to spend a lot of time during the week working on intricate play at the top of the box, getting strikes away, because you're going to be dealing with big, heavy balls into the box from wide areas or central areas. So it's just trying to make sense of the information you have. Like I said, I like having information, but again, you're going to try and tailor the session towards what your team specifically need and what your goalkeepers specifically need against the team that you're going to be playing against. Um, I, I want to bring this up, uh, Ryan, because how are you doing on time right now? Because I know you're you're a little bit limited because you've got you got you got to head to some other responsibilities. So. I, I'm 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 good for another whatever twenty five minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Fine. Okay, no great. Worries. Then uh, let, let let's move on to some match actions if that's if that's cool with you. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, th these are all from FC Cincinnati too. The first one I kind of want to bring up right here. Uh, this is from what from what I gather. I think this is the sixty fourth minute. This is an interesting situation because you have a veteran goalkeeper stepping in for FC2 right now, Evan Lauro. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, great, you know, great uh, experience, you know, in USL, you know, obviously, and, and in MLS too as well uh, in the reserve, reserve levels and also in the first team. Um, how do you handle first off when you have a goalkeeper, a veteran goalkeeper come down from the first team into this environment? And, and 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 the coaching aspect of this from from the games. Honestly, he makes it easy. Okay, he makes it easy. Evan Evan is Evan is a really good pro. He's a really good person. Comes with a boatload of experience, and he just wants to play. He wants to be a goalkeeper. He wants to improve. So, yeah, I mean, in, in answer to your question, Michael, the, the the simple answer is there's no great adjustment that I have to make when Evan comes down. He's, he's a good leader around the place. He cares. He wants to win. He comes with a good mentality. And in our group that has a lot of younger players, he, he's, he's such an integral part of it and an essential part when we are fortunate enough for him to come and play. Yeah. So let, let's, let's go through this play right here. So this is uh this is against Columbus two, I think crew two um, very recently, actually, right. You guys, uh, this, yeah, just, just this past weekend. This, yeah. is the Dar this is the Derby, right? This is the Derby. The, uh, the, the big rivalry between you two right here. Uh, so uh, Fusan uh, dribbles at an angle. Uh, Laurel cuts it off at the near post right here. He stays big. The ball's tried to be shot opposite side of the chase. Uh, and Laurel was able to get down. Great save. Then discovery, recognizing where the ball is to make sure that it's not in a dangerous area. Let's, let's take it from the top here. So first off, what's the picture the goalkeeper seeing here? And what are the consistencies you see in Laurel's game in these types of scenarios? So it's, it's something that we talk about, and, and, and in some of the other clips you'll see it as well. In situations like this, where there is a clear line to the goal, you would quite often see goalkeepers maybe just come rushing off their line. But I think when, you, when you've got to take into account that there's pressure on the, on, on, on the left side, the, the player closest to him, Haroon Conte, is, is getting, while it's not physical pressure on the player, he's getting time pressure on the player, which is a version of pressure, right? It doesn't always have to mean that, oh, there's a slide tackle coming in or he's going to win it. Time pressure can often be enough to alter the striker's success. So if Evan comes rushing off the line, he gives himself less time and now the finish doesn't need to be as good. All he needs to do is just literally poke it by Evan and the ball can end up in the middle of the goal. So Evan does a really good job of just coming into line versus down the line when he doesn't need to. The, the, the acute angle of the strike means that if Evan just holds good shape there, it's going to take a pretty good finish to come back across, especially with Haroon coming and cutting off that, off that backside. So if Evan just stands and holds good shape, now he can get a good hand on it. He keeps his weight forward. He drives that right hand to the ball. And if you notice his left hand, it joins the party. It doesn't just hang out by itself. It shoots across the body to help take momentum and take all of the body across, as opposed to just having the right arm reach out by itself. And I think I think that's actually the reason why he got enough of a an, enough of a touch on that ball to play it into a into a safe area. Because if he had not dragged that left hand across and had just gone with the right hand, that could have been spilled into a dangerous area right there. And then you know, um, you know, luckily there was nobody there. Somebody was there to clear it up. Obviously, some great organizational play uh, that way. But but you never know. Um, and you're better off, you know, trying to be you know safe about it. I, I just think it's so important for young goalkeepers when we talk about consistency, is to understand that, you know, if you're consistent with your shoot 
of being able to get all of your momentum and all of your all of your arms into it, uh, you're going to be better off in the long run. Yeah. So we we talk about. I mean, Paul Paul is 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 a real technician when it comes to goalkeeping. So we talk about shape. We talk about catching the ball. These 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 skills and arts and goalkeeping that seem to be seem to be lost in terms of just wanting to actually catch the ball. So Evans shape right on the strike. He's got his shoulders and, and and hands in front of the knees. He's nice and balanced on his feet. That even if Fusan was to was to zip it into the near post pocket, Evans still light enough on his feet that he can use his left foot to cover that pocket. Even if it comes across his body low on the floor, his right foot is still engaged enough, but light enough that he can now kick his right foot out to make that save as well. His hands are out in front of the body line. So now he gives himself room to operate with hands as opposed to being behind, where now he's going to be forced to go with one. The fact that his hands are out in front of the hip line means that that left hand can shoot across. Not necessarily that it's going to be a two-handed save, but it's enough to allow the back shoulder to attack it, to send that heavy part of my body over into line with the ball and stay strong. Again, his eyes follow the ball as well. It's a, it's a good save. See, I think I think you just brought up a really good point right there, Ryan, because I I hear so many young goalkeepers go, yeah, but you know, uh, I I but the, you know, I only was able to get one hand over to the blah 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 to the ball. You know, why would I have the other hand go across? And you just have to explain body shape and momentum, and that yes, not every save you're going to get two hands to the ball. However, making sure that you have that trailing arm is going to allow your momentum so that you can make that save with the outside arm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You see it all the time, right? People just want to go one, one armed for a save. But if, if the, if, if I'm diving out to my left hand side and my right arm just stays behind, I have less reach. And then if you think about that right arm, just kind of doing that windmill over the top again, it's, it's slowing me down if anything. So Paul, uh, Paul references it all the time is his reference to that backhand attacking would be shooting it under the chin. My reference to it would be, would be attacking the ball with your back shoulder to make sure that everything is coming across in, in, into line with the ball. Even if I'm only going with one, I can go two to one. It's a lot easier to go two to one as against one to then two, realizing, oh, all of a sudden I can catch it. Now you won't catch it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I want to move on to this clip right here because I think this is another, another really good clip. And also it's uh, visually, visually appealing because of the camera angle. So shout out to whoever shot this, whichever broadcast did this, shout out to you because uh, you did a great job. Sometimes with these, uh, with these reserve uh, teams or second teams, as, as you like to call them as well too, uh, the camera angles can be a little bit, uh, let, let's just say not, not, uh, not the best. Not not, yeah. not the best. Sometimes it's a stadium camera, you know, uh, way up high in a giant stadium like Gillette Stadium or something like that. And you're like, I don't know what to do with this. I think that's a soccer game. Not exactly sure. <laughs> um, so let, let's go to this. So this is against uh, uh, what's the name of the crown? Crown like what's crown legacy? Crown legacy. Yeah. Crown yeah, legacy. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And see, I didn't know this. So so there's some independent teams in MLS Next Pro as well. Yeah, there's a couple of them. So okay. Uh, Crown Legacy are are the second team for um, for Charlotte, obviously, and there's there's a couple of others as well. Um, but again, they 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 train they train the same facility. They're still they're still basically just just the second team. It's it's more of a marketing idea, like Nashville oh, have gotcha. as well. So it's it's I think it's a, it's 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 a way to be able to get additional sponsorship and to try and uh, try and attract a different fan base, I suppose. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's not like you guys just did a scrimmage against like a local men's league team or anything like that. So this is like... <laughs> no, no. This was this was out. Uh, this was out in Charlotte. It was actually a lovely facility. They've done they've done a really really good job. So um, this was one of our early games in the season. And um, Crown Legacy are a good side. They're they're sitting top of the league and and they beat us here on the day two one. And um, Paul Walters has had a had a he's 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 had a day to be fair to him. So 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 that that that's a great point right there that you just brought up, Paul Walters. So now. It's not Evan, uh, you know, who's a who's a veteran who I believe in his late twenties now. Late twenties, Evan's late twenties now. I would say. We'll say mid. We'll 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 keep Evan happy. We'll keep we'll keep Evan happy. We'll say we'll say we'll say mid twenties. So now you got an eighteen year old in goal. So obviously that's going to change the dynamic with the team. Uh, not saying Paul's not a great goalkeeper, but it definitely changes the dynamic in regards to the amount of experience, the amount of pictures that he's seen at this level. Um, So this is a three v three. Ball's played across the goal by Cambridge. Um, and uh, Walters kind of comes out. He covers that space. It's like a fast approach, then that slow arrival. Um, and he holds in and kick saves on. Is that I, I, Agiema? Is that is that the name of the player? Agiema? I, I believe so, yeah. I believe yeah. so. He's very, very good as well. Very, very good yeah. on the day. Yeah. So but- let, let's, let's start from the very beginning right here. So first off, this scenario right here, 
uh, the 3v3, what is Paul seeing and, and what are the consistencies you see in his game in these types of scenarios? Yeah, so it's, it's a big topic of conversation for us with Paul because, again, he is a young goalkeeper and, and, and we're trying to kind of get a, get a stamp on, on what we're looking for out of him. Um, so again, the height that you play away from the goal is, is going to be an important piece of it as well. But right now in this situation, there's a few things that he's got to, got to be able to address. Isaiah would be the closest player to him, um, closest player to the 36. So Paul has to stay in an area to A, deal with the strike from the 36. If the 36 was to take an additional touch and strike with his left, Paul has to stay in a position to be able to deal with shot stopping primarily. But he's also got to be in, in, in enough of a position to deal with should that ball get slipped into the, into the player at the rightmost side of the screen. So there's quite a little bit going on just out of the screen. Obviously, on the left side is where that third runner comes from. So Paul's looking at three different scenarios. There could be a strike from the 36. There could be a slotted ball here on this near side, or there could be that ball played onto the other side. And you can't play everything. So he's got to deal with what would appear to be the most dangerous one at that given point, which would be if 36 takes an additional touch inside, he can now strike. So that's why Paul has to stay set in that position that he does. Again, as soon as that ball's played, now there's no pressure on the ball and it's quite close to the frame of the goal. So it's unlike Evan's one. This is now coming down the, coming down the heart of the goal. The player's already the other side of Joey. At that point, if Paul stays on his line, I mean, you're a sitting duck at that point. So the percentages would be well and truly stacked in favour of, of the crown legacy player to score. So we talk about it. If the percentages aren't stacked in your favour, what can we do to grab a couple more percent back in our pocket? So Paul recognises, OK, he's taken a touch. Now I've got the opportunity to use to use my big body to now get something out in front of the player. And he does a really good job of getting into the floor early enough so he doesn't leave big pockets of space on the ground underneath. So where the player looks to slot it underneath, if Paul tries to be a bit more aggressive and take one more, now that pocket of space is under Paul. So he makes an outstanding save. His, his chest stays square to the game. He's still got good use of his right arm. He's still got use of his left arm. And he stays with his head square as well on the strike, which is which is an outstanding save at a, at a really critical moment in the game too. I love what you just said right there in regards to this type of a save here, because I think one of the mistakes that happens a lot of times, young goalkeepers will see an action like this and they say, my coach told me to stay up, but this goalkeeper went down. I said, well, there's a difference between the going down. So, and driving your body down, but you're still in an upright position because if you notice like you're bringing out is that when he makes the final action, he's still in a position where he can readjust based on where that ball goes. He's not sliding down on his butt and then hoping that the ball hits him. He's, he's making an actual intentional decision to slide that leg out to cover that space, that dangerous area. Yeah, because there's, there's, there's a couple of ways we can look at it. And we talk about it when we talk about one, uh, 1v1 scenarios and stuff as well. I think that the block and the spread are, 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 are just the modern way that, that, that people are coaching now. And it's kind of like the you know, the one size fits all approach to, to goalkeeping is, you know, you're going to start seeing strikes from 18 yards now and people in the goal trying to spread. It's, it's, it's bizarre. But I think when the, when the opportunity does present itself to use a spread or a smother, it's an extremely valuable tool if used in the right way. And I think Paul does an exceptional job of coming down the line, recognizing that if this top quality player is eight yards from goal with no physical or time pressure on him, my best choice isn't necessarily going to be staying two yards off the line because unless it's a poor finish, it's going to be a goal. I'm going to be picking out of the back of the net. So can we grab some percentages back in my favor? Yeah, he does a great job of doing that, but he doesn't just go brave, hard, aggressive down the line and just throw himself in the, in the general direction. He, he takes space extremely quick. He decels to give himself still control of his body to be able to move to the ball as opposed to saying, I'm going to spread and hopefully the ball hits me. He says, I'm going to get out here and I'm going to move in direction of the ball so it's, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a full-on spread. It's more of a tight-range shot stop in a real close situation where Paul now moves into the line of the ball. He moves off the strike as opposed to, I'm just going to spread in an area and hope that the ball hits me. And again, even if, if, even if 33 lifts the ball, Paul's right arm is still in a decent position that he can adjust. For me, I'd like if it was a little bit further in front of the body where he can now see it in his eye line. But again, he makes an outstanding save and stays square to the play, which is, which is excellent. The moment you turn your upper body, you're going to create bigger pockets of space to concede goals where good players will find it underneath. Again, with the ball on the ground, he does a good job in covering low areas. If the ball's bouncing when it gets played into 33, then maybe his approach is different and maybe he just comes big at the player. Yeah, I, um, I, 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 I love what you just said right there. Um, I want to bring up 
this save right over here. I think this is also Paul. This is against New England Revolution, right? This that crazy game yeah. that was like nine to nine or something like that. Like it was, <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot going on. Uh, it's a good game and, for the neutral. Yeah, exactly. So this is the 80th minute, right? It's a uh, ball is kind of like taken down by Rivera at the near post here. And again, it's one of those situations similar to Evan. Like, why would you shoot out at this ball right there? Because it's like. He's not dangerous if you shoot if, if, if you that if, if you stay right there because if, essentially it looks like you got good coverage on your back post right there and you're eliminating that near post chance right there. So he kind of holds in front of the post, waits for him to make a decision. He hits that shot to the near post and it's a simple, comfortable save out of bounds right there. Positioning is key. Positioning and good shape will will get you out of so much trouble. Look how relaxed he is in that moment. So it gets played into Rivera in the wide area. Paul makes his micro adjustment in. He doesn't over move. He's not slow moving in. He's rapidly into line. Like I say to them all the time, you're better off getting into the pocket of space you need to be in early. The game moves too quick for us to move slowly. Get in there early. And even if you're in there early, right? What will you do with the what would you do with the extra time you have? Just throw it in your back pocket. I'd rather get in somewhere early with time to spare as against getting there on the strike. If I have a little bit of time in my back pocket, it gives me a chance to have another adjustment or to just feel that bit more comfortable to produce a successful action. And that's exactly what he does. It's a smart save. It's an important save, but it's a, it's, it's a simple save for him because of the work that he does before the strike and before the player gets it in full control. Yeah, you know, one, one thing I noticed with a lot of young goalkeepers is like, let's see here. So if we go back to right here. So, boom. The second this ball is being played here, I've seen so many young goalkeepers immediately approaching and chasing that that player right there. But look at the way this ball drops. Based on that, if he does that, the ball's just lifted, lifted, lifted over the goal. Um, and a lot of times young goalkeepers are successful in this action because the touch isn't the greatest, you know, but they have to recognize again, when we start talking about consistent habits, okay, we are training you to be prepared for the next level. We're not training you to be able to deal with this player at this level right now. So what's going to be the best action for a player, a world-class player in this moment? Like, are you going to treat it differently? You know, because then, you know, I, I, it's just all over the place. No, for sure. I think, I think like we said on a couple of the other clips, in this moment, there's good pressure on the ball. It's going away from goal. So there's no reason for me to come rushing off my line. If I just, if I rely on having good shape, good position, being nice and balanced and composed in the goal, from that angle, it should be a save. I would be bitterly disappointed with Paul if there's a goal conceded there. But on the flip side of it, he makes a smart save because of the work that he does, because his fundamentals are good. And I think as a department, I think our biggest our biggest thing is fundamentals. Is fundamentals is making sure that positionally you position yourself well. Your movement in the goal is rapid, and that you allow yourself the time to get composed and have a good deceleration to produce a good action at the end of it. Yeah, Ryan, I, I know I know we're starting to get get light on time right here. Are there any other any other clips that you wanted to go through from from the actions that you sent, or or, or are you good on your end? Yeah, so there's, there's the one here um, from the corner with Paul, the double save. This might be the double save one. Um, and again, this just this just goes down to a desire to keep the ball out of the goal. That's not something I've pulled on a heat map and gone, oh, by the way, Paul, we're <laughs> going to have a look at this one here this week where you save a bullet header from six yards out and then you're going to get up and you're going to save a smash off the ground from four yards out. There's no heat map that'll show you that. There's no... There's no preparation that I can say, look, Paul, in the 85th minute or the 88th minute, you're going to make a world-class save. But what it comes down to are consistent habits. When we train, once he realizes he's not coming for the cross, the speed of his movement into the line of the ball, rather than just tracking the ball, he figures out where the danger is coming from, where the contact is coming from. I can find the line of the ball in my peripheral vision, but if I can find the cross is coming in, it's coming to Michael's head, I'm better off finding Michael and now tracking the ball in my peripheral so now I can see when the contact comes in as against just tracking the ball. And now I'm still moving when you change your run and get contact on the ball. And then the second one is getting off is getting off the floor. Play it till it's dead. Bang. Great save. It's a yeah. desire to keep the ball out of the goal, Michael. And I think it's 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 an under under undervalued, underappreciated um aspect of goalkeeping, which quite often when you think about a goalkeeper, even if they choose the wrong action or the wrong technique or whatever else, if they go with full bravery and they go with a desire to keep the ball out of the goal, sometimes your wrong decision can be negated because of your bravery, your aggression, and your pure 100% desire to keep the ball out of the goal. Not all of the time, 
But at a, at a certain level, you will get away with making the wrong decision, but sticking with your guns and showing a desire to keep the ball out of the goal. I, I love what you just said right there. I mean, I, I just can't even tell you, just even just using myself as an example, the, the times that I give a 110% on a mistake, mistaken action to recover like maybe, maybe 20% of the time I, it ends up becoming successful. And it, as opposed to just assuming that it's dead and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I want a lot of young goalkeepers to hear that out there. Um, because again, like you said, goals are going to be scored, but it is your job to do everything in your power to prevent that ball from getting in the net in that moment right there. Um, especially in today's culture, Ryan, I, I think there's, there's a definitely a, uh, I don't want. I don't want to say that there's a there, there's a a trend of young players, you know, uh, putting the blame on somebody else for uh, for the goal getting scored. But but I, I've definitely seen it where a goalkeeper could have done more, and because of their insecurity, they don't want to admit that to their team, and so they just go, oh well, if so and so had been in blah blah blah. Yeah, well, you know, again, you can't control what they do other than giving giving some feedback and giving some communication. But you can control what you can do in those actions. 100%. Look, Paul makes a world-class save off the header. I'm, I'm happy enough with the first save that he makes. But if he doesn't get off the floor to deal with the bits and pieces of the secondary one, we walk away having lost that game pretty late on. Mm -hmm. As opposed to Paul makes a great save rather than looking around saying, oh, well, he's not marked and he's not helping. He says, right, I've made one great save. Have a little bit of that. Right, there's plenty more where that came from. And he gets up and he says, no, it's not happening. I've conceded enough today. I'm going to have this, this one's for me and I'm going to make, I'm going to make a great save again because I have a desire and a belief that I'm going to keep the ball out of the goal because it's instilled in me on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis, uh, basis and on a monthly basis. I'm not going to allow the ball go into the goal easily. So that's why he gets up and he makes an outstanding second save. That doesn't come down to, oh, Paul, I told you to use that technique. It comes down to the environment that Paul Rogers creates, the environment that I like to hold him standard with as well, that, you, you never give up on any ball. We can always talk about it after the fact, but let's not give up something because of a lack of trying or a lack of belief or a lack of desire. You might have seen Roman save this weekend in the in the 92nd minute against Columbus. Same thing. It's not a textbook save. He shows an unbelievable desire to scramble across the goal and to keep it out of the goal, which ultimately wins the team three points and they sit on top of the MLS. They're the game-changing moment. You can have a match-defining moment through bravery, through aggression, and having a desire to keep the ball out of the goal. I love it, man. And, and, and by providing that consistency in your environment, you create those types of moments uh, because you develop those types of goalkeepers. Uh, Ryan, this has been amazing, man. This, is, this has been awesome. Um, for those of you guys uh, who want to reach out, it is a contact at Goalkeeper Podcast on the Union for a guest topic or a topic suggestion. I mean, a guest or a topic suggestion, man, I really need to get lunch right now. My head is uh, a little loopy right now. Uh, speaking of the union, if you're not on the union yet, guys, uh, it is a place to engage with top uh, uh, coaches and players from all around the world uh, for free. Start getting on that. We are going to be starting to offer a premium service as well, too, with some top names that you're going to be able to do breakdown sessions with and uh, some other types of really cool activities, some exclusive content from them only available on the union. Uh, Ryan, I believe you're on the union. What is your union handle? My union hand is going to be Coulter GK1. Um, I'm going to start getting quite active on that now as well, posting, posting content uh, several times a week. Uh, there's no shortage of the content. Uh, again, like I've said earlier, I think context is going to be key. So if anyone has any questions over anything that I post, whether you like it, think it's weird, think it's wonderful, whatever it might be, I'm always open to engage it in discussions about goalkeeping. Um, yeah, just a bit of a goalkeeper nerd. So any questions anyone has on anything that I ever post, honestly, feel free to just reach out. I love it, guys. I love it, guys. And, and shout out to all you guys who've been engaging on the union and been posting your own original content as well in the forum. Uh, again, it's not just the big guys like Ryan here. Uh, we want to we want to learn from everybody. So even if you're a grassroots coach or a grassroots player, you know, there, there's something we can all learn from each other. And I think that collaboration, that collaborative community is really uh, is, is really what's going to keep uh, improving goalkeeping culture here. Uh, and not just in the United States, but worldwide. Uh, I think, well, you know, I, I shout out to all the guys. I think someone recently just joined from Ethiopia, Belarus, all over the world. And, and I, I really love to see that because I don't know a lot about Ethiopian goalkeeping. I don't know a lot about Belarusian goalkeeping. I'd love to learn what, they, what they're doing out there. So that's, that's uh, pretty awesome. Uh, all right, guys, I'm going to make some lunch. That's all the time on Inside the 18, and we are out.
Later, guys. Yeah!